Today will be the last time you see me for a while because tomorrow I'm going to London. Uh, I'm not sure where I'll be staying, but God has told me to go to London. London is a, a big city. Lots of people live there. It's full of business and economic activity. It buzzes with nightlife. People there live freely and mostly within legal boundaries, of course. Many have a live like you want to live approach to life. Some parts of London are very dangerous to walk around, especially at night. There are many different religions in London, lots of different gods. God wants me to go and tell everyone in London about Jesus, to tell them to believe in Jesus and change their worldly ways. So I'm going to invite people to meetings every day and preach that Jesus is the way, the only way. It'll be a challenge, I know. Some will believe, but many will probably refuse to believe or even listen to what I have to say. There are some Christians in London, and I'm sure they will help and support me. But I'm also sure that we will face a lot of opposition probably resentment and ridicule, maybe even hostility and physical attack. But hey-ho, I'm going anyway because God wants me to go. Actually, I'm not really leaving, but what I've described here is similar to what a number of Christians have done through the centuries and still do. They up sticks and go to unfamiliar, dangerous places because God tells them to go. Because he wants them to show the love of Jesus to people who are spiritually lost. About 60 years ago, David Wilkerson, uh, an American pastor, went to New York to minister to the young gangs there. This was the beginning of a worldwide teenage ministry called Teen Challenge. A few years later, Jackie Pullinger, a young musician and would-be missionary, went to Hong Kong, not knowing exactly what God was planning for her to do. In the end, it was to start a ministry to help drug addicts and street sleepers and to lead them to Jesus. These are just two of many examples whose ministries have led to many people turning to Jesus for salvation. And in today's uh, passage from Acts, we've got two characters who were among the missionary pioneers of the early church. Paul, who we are familiar with, and Apollos, who we're introduced to for the first time. Just on this one page of the Bible, Paul traveled from Antioch, through the regions of Galatia and Phrygia, and then on to Ephesus. And Apollos had come from Alexandria in Egypt, as I said before, and he went to Ephesus, and eventually went on to the region of Achaia. So they both did a lot of traveling. They went wherever God called them to go. They totally submitted to the will of God. And when God's people submit totally to his will, we can see from this passage that humility overcomes pride. And the practical and the spiritual work together. And godliness replaces worldliness. So let's think about these three things for a few moments. First of all, humility overcomes pride. I'm looking here at uh, chapter 18 from verse 24 through to chapter 19, verse 3, but I'm just going to read the first few, a few of those verses. From verse 24, it says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila 
heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Quite a, a few years ago, I joined a, an accountancy group that was linked to the professional institute I was a member of. For one of the meetings, I was asked to do a talk on who is Neville Pereira. Uh, I called the talk Faith, Family, and Football. And talking about family and football was easy. But I was a bit nervous about sharing my faith with a group of ambitious accountants who seemed to be very secular in their thinking. To my amazement, though, there was rapturous applause at the end, and the transcript was even passed to the Institute's head office for inclusion in the next edition of their national uh, monthly magazine. And the lesson I learned from that experience is that I should never be afraid to share my faith with anyone. And like I said a few moments ago, this passage introduces us to a new character in the New Testament, someone who was not afraid to share his faith, Apollos. The verses I've just read tell us a few things about who Apollos was. Uh, from verse 24, we see that he was a Jew from Alexandria in Egypt. He was uh, educated and well-versed in the scriptures. From verse 25, we can see that he had a godly upbringing, he was enthusiastic, and he was a good teacher. And verse 26, we see that he was pretty sure of his facts, but at the same time, he recognized that he didn't know everything, and he was willing to learn. He was teachable. And then in verse 27, we see he was willing to travel for the sake of the gospel, and he was supportive of other believers and their efforts to spread the gospel. And in verse 28, we see that he was an apologist. An apologist is someone who speaks in defense of someone or something, uh, in this case, in defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when Apollos first arrived in Ephesus, his understanding of the gospel was incomplete. Verse 25 says, though he knew only the baptism of John. The same was true of some other Christians in Ephesus. When Paul arrived there and asked them what baptism they had received, they replied, John's baptism. The John in question is, of course, John the Baptist. His baptism was a baptism of repentance. In Matthew 3 and verse 11, he's quoted as saying, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. With John's baptism, a person repented of sin and was therefore ready to place his faith in Jesus, the one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. The people who John baptized were told that the Christ was coming. Their baptism demonstrated a recognition of their sin, a desire for spiritual cleansing, and a commitment to follow God's law in anticipation of the Messiah's arrival. Christian baptism supersedes John's baptism. While it also symbolizes repentance, it's much more than that. It's a mark of our identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. His sacrifice on the cross completely washes away our sins, and through his resurrection we are raised to new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesus, Apollos probably preached the message of repentance and faith in Jesus. We're not told exactly what he preached, but we are told that his teaching was accurate. However, he knew only the baptism of John. He was not aware of the full 
magnitude of Jesus' death and resurrection and what it means for those who turn to Jesus. Aquila and Priscilla saw that his theology was a bit kind of skew-if. But note that they didn't criticize or reprimand him in public. Instead, they invited him to their home, a sign of fellowship, and lovingly helped him to fill in the gaps in his understanding of Jesus. And to his credit, instead of allowing pride and resentment get in the way, Apollos took on board what his new friends had to say. He clearly wanted, first and foremost, to preach the truth about Jesus. He didn't allow his pride to get in the way of that. He was teachable. His humility enabled him to be armed with the complete message. He left Ephesus and went to the region of Achaia, spending some time in the city of Corinth, debating with the Jews that, 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 and proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He had become a, like a preacher extraordinaire. Meanwhile, Paul arrived in Ephesus and the power of the Holy Spirit was displayed in all its glory. Having been told that the uh, disciples there had received John's baptism, Paul said in chapter 19 and verse 4, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And then a few verses later, verses 11 to 12, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. This was a bit like a Pentecost revisited with people receiving the Holy Spirit and being able to do amazing things that they couldn't do before. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He's an enabler. In verses 8 to 10, uh, they describe how Paul's ministry met with some severe opposition. But for the next two years, he and his fellow disciples were able to preach and teach the gospel in the premises of a, of a man called Tyrannus. Because, so they moved from the synagogue where they were meeting with this hostility and uh, Tyrannus, I guess he presumably was a convert or sympathizer towards the faith. And by the end of those two years, everyone in the province of Asia was without excuse. They had all heard the truth about Jesus. And then in verses 11 to 12, we see how Paul's obedient ministry stirred up a mighty spiritual war. Ever since his conversion on the Damascus Road in Acts 9, Paul had been guided, driven, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here in Ephesus, God, the Holy Spirit, was rubber-stamping Paul's ministry with amazing acts of healing, and evil spirits were being driven out. But then in verses 13 to 16, we see that, as is often the case, there were some who tried to jump on the bandwagon for personal gain. The King James Version of the Bible describes them as vagabond Jews, exorcists. They weren't followers of Jesus, but having seen Paul's success in driving out evil spirits in the name of Jesus, they thought they would try the same thing. But evil spirits are not stupid. They're evil, but they're not stupid. They know a true believer from a fake. In Mark and Luke's gospel accounts of the demon-possessed man, the evil spirits recognized Jesus and knew they were powerless against him. This evil spirit recognized these seven sons of Sceva as fakes. They had no power over it. They weren't speaking in the name of Jesus himself. They didn't know him. So how could they speak in his name? They were trying to invoke the name of Jesus, who they knew of, through Paul. They weren't doing it for the benefit of the demon-possessed man, 
for his salvation. Instead, they were doing it for their own benefit. They hoped it would bring them recognition and financial gain. Their own selfish agenda was their priority. But regarding Paul, the evil spirit declares, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul. Paul's priority was to lead people to Jesus. He put his trust in Jesus, and the demons knew it. James 4 and verse 7 says, Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. With the Holy, with the Holy Spirit's leading, this is what Paul did. God's agenda was his priority. And I hope and pray that God's agenda is, is your and my priority also. The, the drama that took place in Ephesus during these two years of Paul's ministry displayed the Holy Spirit's power in no uncertain terms. He led the way and Paul acted in practical ways in response to his leading. The practical and the spiritual work alongside each other. It's not one or the other. On more than one occasion I've heard people say there are those who pray and those who do. As if it's either or. But if we're only praying or only doing, then nothing is achieved in the name of Jesus. We end up doing things in our own strength instead of the Holy Spirit's power. And many Christians don't fully acknowledge the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We tend to give credence to God the Father and God the Son, but when it comes to God the Holy Spirit, there's a tendency to shy away from him. When we hear about what the Holy Spirit did in places like Ephesus, how many of us look at these events with skepticism and say, no thanks, I don't want any of that? It's like we put the Holy Spirit in a box and only let him out when it suits us. But unless we submit to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we will never fully understand what Jesus' what Jesus' death and resurrection means and the obligation it puts on us to proclaim him to our lost world. Paul's ministry was in total submission to the Holy Spirit. And the result? Just look at the turnaround that took place in Ephesus. Chapter 19 and verse 17. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread wide and spread widely and grew in power. The Jews and Greeks in Ephesus were seized with fear. But this was a healthy fear. It was the fear of God. And the, the fear of God is another whole sermon, so we won't dwell on it today. But suffice it to say that these people came to the realization that their lives were going in the wrong direction. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul had shown them a better way, the Jesus way. Those who went this way and turned to Jesus in faith confessed their sins. They repented. Then they put their money where their mouth was. They burned their valuable sorcery scrolls worth 50,000 drachmas. Uh, you'll see a footnote at the bottom of page 1115 uh, of, the, of, the bi of your Bibles that says a drachma was a silver coin worth about a day's wages. So 50,000 drachmas was clearly a lot of money. The Jews and Greeks who turned to Jesus were willing to give up this money. Following Jesus was more important than their wealth. But it wasn't their wealth that was the problem. It was how they were obtaining it through ungodly means. They were willing to change their ways no matter the cost. They were being transformed from worldliness to godliness. 
And as a result, the spiritual war reached a climax. Converted Jews and Greeks declared whose side they were now on. The gospel of Jesus Christ was spreading fast and gaining power. Verse 20 begins uh, with the words, in this way. And what do you think that means, in this way? What specifically had happened for the word of the Lord to spread widely and grow in power? I think there are two key actions of these new believers here. One is they openly confessed their evil deeds. And the second is they burned their sorcery scrolls publicly. They didn't consider their newfound faith to be a private matter between them and God. In spite of the environment they lived in, they were open and public. They were fully aware of the hostility they could be subjected to. They'd seen the way Paul was treated in the synagogue sometime earlier. They were also well aware of the potential financial consequences. Once they had openly and publicly declared their newfound faith, there was no turning back. By the power of the Holy Spirit, from now on they would fear God, they would trust God, and they would always stand up for Jesus. So what does all this mean for us today? What are the challenges set before us? Well, first of all, let's remind ourselves about Apollos. Of all his quite substantial qualities, the one that strikes me the most is his humility. Despite being a learned, educated man, he recognized that there was still so much for him to learn. In humility, he embraced it. He was teachable. He didn't allow his pride or anything else get in the way. So be teachable. None of us knows everything there is to know about God. There is still so much to learn. The second thing is that God wants us to be both practical and spiritual. Paul's ministry was loaded with practical activity, but it was spirit-led, Holy Spirit-led. Let's not put the Holy Spirit in a box, letting him out only on our own terms. We can't be effective Christians without the Holy Spirit guiding and leading us in every aspect of our lives. And thirdly, the new believers in Ephesus went from one lifestyle to another, old to new. They were new creations in Christ. Their lives were transformed from worldly living to godly living. They stood up for Jesus publicly, no turning back. Now let's examine our hearts and see to what extent we are willing to stand up for Jesus publicly with family, friends, neighbors, work colleagues, social and leisure acquaintances, with everyone we meet. Let me encourage you with a few verses of scripture as I close. Joshua 1 and verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean, lean, not on his own, sorry, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. And then right at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28 and verse 20, Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're not alone. The Father sent Jesus to die for our sins. He sent the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name to guide us. Paul, Apollos, and the new believers in Ephesus all recognized these truths and submitted to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did amazing things through them. If we submit our lives to him, he will do amazing things through us. And the word of the Lord will spread widely and grow in power.